Um, super. So uh, thank you again, Kyle, for joining us today. Um, for those of you who missed it yesterday, we stayed a little bit higher level, maybe a little bit more business oriented and kind of goals. And today's, today's uh, you know, I'm wearing my geek hat today. So if you joined any of the talks from earlier today, we were totally geeking out. Um, and that's what I want to do with Kyle today. Um, but with, without further ado, um, Kyle, I would love for you to tell, don't assume that the audience that is here today was here yesterday. So if you would, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm Kyle Ruckman. I've been at Under Armour for the past six years. I originally started out there as a build and release engineer, brought on to automate uh, deployments and releases of the software. Um, since then, I've kind of automated away that position and have switched over to our infrastructure platform team, uh, where I've built internal platform as a service systems that were uh, pre-Kubernetes. Um, so we had dashboards and things that people could use to deploy their services to AWS with, that were just on bare EC2 instances. We had tooling for that. And I maintained that. And starting about two years ago, we started our Kubernetes journey um, we were kind of building something similar and Kubernetes came out and beat us to the punch essentially and it's really awesome. So we saw that and we started to shift over to adoption of that. So for the past two years, I've been leading the adoption of Kubernetes and now GitOps practices uh, at Under Armour. And uh, I, I learned about Flux uh, and Weaveworks uh, in the last year or so as they came into the CNCF. And uh, I'm really loving Flux and what it has done for our organization and our, our transforming our delivery pipelines. Um, and it's been an awesome journey so far. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I find it interesting, you know, I mentioned this yesterday when you introduced yourself, I find it so interesting and I don't think it's at all coincidence that you come from a background of build and release um, engineering and you said the word automation already. Um, and I, I personally spend a fair bit of time in the DevOps enterprise community, DevOps community, and we talk a lot about automation. And what might have you might have brought in is kind of like, doesn't everybody do automation? You know, that's kind of what you did. That was the job that you did. And in fact, as you said, you automated yourself out of a job. Um, there's still so much in IT that that hasn't embraced that automation. And what I find interesting is that GitOps is kind of a different spin on it. It's a different view on automation than maybe what we've done in the past. And, and we'll certainly draw into that in some of the uh, examples. So you just mentioned Flux um, and you know Flux, uh, I think has been mostly, has been largely used to bring YAML from a Git repository. So the, the language, the same language of Kubernetes um, from the Git repository in. So I'm assuming that there's some, what I would call kind of vanilla use cases that perhaps you started with that you could tell us a little bit about. Yeah, we actually, when we started our Kubernetes journey, we didn't use Flux. Uh, I don't know if it was around at the time when we we started. Um, we we What we wanted to do with our engineers is, is level them up and make sure that they understand uh, the Kubernetes core specs really well. So we had them using kubectl and manually applying to the cluster. Uh, and this began to grow and we started to feel the burden of it, of having everyone do kubectl apply themselves or at different times. Um, and we had like hundreds of YAMLs across 30 plus repositories. And then we had a cluster outage um, and we had to rebuild the cluster. And that took a huge uh, effort from our developers because they had to go either run their CI pipelines that at the end of it was applying YAMLs to the cluster or they had to go dig up wherever their YAMLs were stored in their repositories. Sometimes we had to go find them as the infrastructure team to get that cluster back up and running. So we saw a need there. We saw a need of like basically kubectl apply automation <laughs> um, and that's when we found Flux. And so we started adopting it with you know very specific cases like uh, a, a service that this infrastructure team owns. We, we actually had transformed our um, old platform that we were running our apps with. We, that was just a Docker container previously deployed on EC2 instance. We transformed that and, and deployed that on Kubernetes. So it was a service that we managed. So we took that as the first step. Let's put that into Flux and, and feel out what it's like to do GitOps with that thing. And you know, it just snowballed after that, right? You just do another thing and another thing and another thing. And 
finally you get there. I think one of the things that that brought out is our developers who already were doing uh, kubectl apply is that um, there were d uh, differences, right? What was actually applied to the cluster and what files they had laying around or on their machine or whatever Git repository wasn't necessarily the desired state that they wanted because someone had done something manually or done something, uh, you know, off hours or during an incident that didn't get tracked down or, or written down and committed somewhere. So um, when we built, rebuilt that cluster, when we had that outage, we actually had a team apply the YAMLs that they thought were the updated thing and it rolled back features, which is really bad. Um, and so it cra the app crashed and we had to like debug that and we finally realized, oh, that wasn't the most updated thing because during some incident they had made us like tweak or something like that. So uh, once we had that, it was it was really amazing to see the benefit. That is fantastic. So you just in that that one story touched upon so many of the things that we talk about. So we've been talking about how, and and, and uh, Stefan just talked about it at the beginning of his session as well, that um, the loose coupling of the CI pipeline from the delivery, and then how delivery kind of plays that bridge over into the operational side. So Kubernetes was taking on a lot of the burden of the operations with with its you know re with its controllers and as its reconciliation but pulling that out of the CI process. And then that whole thing about drift. <laughs> and so for people who don't maybe know Flux as well, I'll chime in that part of the way that, that Flux plays a role in keeping that drift from happening is it doesn't necessarily stop somebody from kubectl applying something, but it will detect that and then either roll that back and say, nope, that's, you know, you can't do that because I'm going to keep in sync with what's in the repository, or at least give you some kind of an alert that says, hey, you've drifted. Because I'm willing to bet that those those folks didn't realize, most of them didn't realize that they had drifted. Yeah, and it was actually a, a big uh, learning hurdle that we had to teach uh, about not making manual changes um, and doing it through Git and committing it there. And we had some hesitations from like power users who wanted more control, right? And they didn't want to give up that manual control that they could have. Um, one of the conversations that came out today in the GitOps channel was about like scaling up and down. Um, and we actually have recently taken to, on our deployment resources, leaving out the replica count. Um, and that allows you to still use kubectl scale to go up and down manually and Flux won't override it because it's not part of the spec there, which is a really interesting way to bridge yourself over to like HPA because you need that replica account not to be there. And then you can finally deploy an HPA, horizontal pod autoscaler, and then do horizontal scaling via a controller like that. So that was an interesting conversation that came out really today. Really interesting. And, and for those of you who are listening that may be a little bit newer to your Kubernetes journey, even when you do a kubectl apply, sometime run the command, and I don't remember exactly what it is, to ask Kubernetes for the, the uh, manifest back because they aren't guaranteed to be the same. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of what Flux is doing for you is it's taking a look at those things. Um, but that's really interesting. So what, what you've actually done is you've made the decision that there's parts of your configuration that really aren't important for things like um, repeatability, um, because those are more dynamic. That's an attribute that's more dynamic that is going to be constantly changing based on load and so on. Mm -hmm. So you've actually gone through this process of partitioning your application configuration into that, which is, this is the stuff that's always the same. And this is the stuff that I'm actually going to allow um, operators to maybe do a little bit more manual with. Yep. Yeah. And it's been a learning process. It's not how we started, right? It was after using it for a while and trying different use cases or finding some need that a developer wanted and then just trying to find a solution or a way around it. So organically. Yeah, yeah really, really cool. Now you just mentioned something about HA. So tell me a little bit more about how you're leveraging. So that was one pattern mm -hmm. that you used was to say, okay, you know, in, in, in the real production environment, that's when we'll have the horizontal, you know, a pod autoscaler um, in the in the in the standby. If you're doing you know active passive in the standby, you don't want to use a whole bunch of resources. So you're going to keep things at a minimum, so that in case you flip over, then you can 
scale that up. So any other patterns that you that emerged in that particular use case? Yeah, so we have some, uh, we run a business that sells shirts and shoes. Uh, we have some high criticality apps there. Um, and so we looked at a way to shift traffic from cluster to cluster. Um, and this is to make uh, the apps more resilient to when we're making infrastructure changes. So what we've uh, set up, and this would not be possible without Flux, um, but is two clusters, two Kubernetes clusters that run the exact same workloads. And at the DNS level, we can switch traffic from one cluster to the other cluster. And that means that we can shift traffic over to the good cluster, work on this other cluster that we want to make changes to, like infrastructure changes, ingress controller changes, Kubernetes upgrades itself, and be comfortable that whatever we're doing, it's not going to affect any tr production traffic. And then we can choose to bleed some traffic back over to that cluster because it's the exact same workloads. And Flux is making sure that in those clusters, the same workloads are, are running for us. And then we can monitor how like 10% of that traffic is working in this new setup in this new cluster. And then finally shift all the way back over and perform that same upgrade on the other cluster and know that we're safe. Um, and it has been a really huge boon to stability and reliability of our apps in those clusters. And this kind of came out of the fact that we've been on our Kubernetes journey pretty long. We started out on pretty early versions of Kubernetes 1.6, 1.7, and have had to do a lot of Kubernetes upgrades ourselves. We don't use uh, GKE or uh, Amazon's cloud services for Kubernetes. So we run it with COPS ourselves, um, and we do a lot of the cluster maintenance with this team. Um, and we've had issues where we've done upgrades and, and with a single cluster, you have an outage and you're like, whoa, my gosh. And then you're trying to like fix stuff from fear or you're frazzled because you're having an outage. And so this has really brought peace of mind to making changes in those high criticality clusters and apps. Yeah. I love how you say you've had outages during upgrades. I've been on my Kubernetes journey for about three years and at, <laughs> at my prior company, you know, we automated all sorts of, we, you know, we did really great release engineering there and did all sorts of tests, but Kubernetes is still so unique. Every single organizations, I mean, you can, you can anti-snowflake your Kubernetes clusters using techniques like flux and declarative configuration for your clusters and CAPI, which we mentioned earlier um, within an organization. But if you're a vendor that's providing a package that needs to be upgraded, the variability from one organization to another is still so great that mm -hmm. cluster, that upgrades are just, there's still just so, such a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's been bugs, like we've had a Calico bug. We have a cluster stuck on 111 that we can't upgrade without taking a full network outage. And there's a lot of apps in there. So the idea, build another cluster, shift traffic over to it, and you're safer. Like you could build it in 115 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, that's great. I'm making some notes because I'm learning so much. Um, so, so that's great. Now, that's you know application workloads. Oh, and one question on that use case that you just talked about. You said that the workloads are guaranteed be, guaranteed to be the same. So you have given a, a, a particular workload. You have one repo, and yes, the flux that's on one cluster on your active cluster is pointing to that repo and the mm -hmm. flux on the other cluster is pointing to that repo. Yes. So that's how you're guaranteed that they're exactly the same. Yep, yep. And when you make changes, it goes, it rolls out to both. And it just depends on whether the traffic is routed to one of the other clusters. Sometimes we sit in a 50-50 split, but we don't have to. Um, what is interesting about this and why one thing I wanna improve about it is like um, having more knowledge and, and scalability is that we have to keep the clusters scaled up so that we could take full traffic in either cluster if we have to shift. Um, so we run at a little bit more of an expense, but it's worth it for the high criticality -ness. Yep, okay, interesting. Um, now there are, you've got one repository, so that describes the workload. How do you achieve abstracting away the differences in those environments? I mean, there's gonna be some differences. Uh, I don't know whether there's, it depends on the workload. I don't know whether they are pointing to different IP addresses or, you know, a, a different a different name of a you know load balancer or anything like that. Are there are there some differences in those environments that you then kind of inject during the deployment process? 
Yeah, and uh, this feature came out in Flux uh, right as we needed it. It was the Customize uh, integration. So we end up using Flux's integration with Customize to overlay those changes from cluster to cluster if we need to. Um, we even deploy out uh, this kind of setup for dev environments where we have Customize using those same YAMLs but applying the dev overrides or, or stuff like that. Um, so that was super critical at the time that we exactly needed it to do this kind of rollout. Yeah, cool. I just started playing with Customize myself recently and I was like, oh, this is so incredibly powerful. You know, bases and then overrides, as he said, super cool stuff. It's interesting, I'm gonna geek out a little bit here, put my propeller head on, but um, it's so interesting that we're starting to take some of these concepts like inheritance and overrides um, that we've had in the in in the programming languages space, and that's what I studied in graduate school was programming languages. And we're starting to see some of those abstractions get realized in these operational tools. And the more and more we start to program operations, the more and more we start to see some of these concepts to come up, coming over from from development. So, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see how the development of these alternative like languages for creating specs come out. Like, there's the the JK. Uh, one by Weaveworks, yep. um, like using actual programming languages to generate the thing that you want. I think that's where this whole concept of DevOps is really just going to eventually be dev, right? And everyone's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I actually, since, since you brought up that subject, I'm going to take just, you know, 30 seconds of your, your mic time here to, sure. to chime in around those languages. Um, so the languages are interesting because uh, YAML is very, very verbose, and um, and it's interesting that you said earlier that you you actually wanted your developers to lear learn Kubernetes, and you wanted them to kubectl apply, which means that they had to code their configuration in the language of Kubernetes, because when you're doing a kubectl apply, you're essentially saying, here, Kubernetes, here's the program that you're going to run, the program being this declarative configuration, you know, mm -hmm. programming is data. Um, but I think that really to scale this to the masses, I don't necessarily think that the implementation language should be the same as the development language. I mean, ultimately, Java gets compiled into bytecode, right? We don't yeah. ask our developers to, to write bytecode. We don't ask our developers to write assembly anymore, even though it'll ultimately become instru you know, machine instructions that run on the server. We've created higher level languages that allow them to program in their domain. Now, I think CRDs start to get that way in that you can start to create these new APIs and things like that, but it's still ultimately YAML. And so there's this concept of you know, extending the APIs and then maybe using a different programming paradigm. Um, I, you know, we heard Kingdon this morning talking about Ruby and here's somebody who knows Ruby better than probably anybody on the face of the planet because he does it day in and day out. Why not let the Ruby developers program in Ruby or something some something close. And so Nate yesterday mentioned CD Cates and CD Cates in particular is supporting things like TypeScript and, and Python, if I remember correctly, as the languages um, that you can use to program things. And then they'll compile that. That's the term I've been using is to compile yeah. that into YAML. Yeah, we've definitely had teams uh, prior to a lot of these tools coming out want that. Um, we've had teams write Python scripts that generate YAML or a bash script that generates YAML or st stuff like that. And so there's definitely, I think from a developer's perspective, a need for that kind of like higher level language than the bytecode YAML, right? Um, and so I, I'm interested in Under Armour to, to see what we come up with or what we pick as a tool there. We haven't dove our foot into that yet. The reason that we wanted people to understand and be able to write the YAML is it's a base building block. So if you understand what's going on down there, you're going to be better at the higher level thing. And you're going to understand how that translates down. We initially started out with uh, Helm really just tentatively when it was early on in 2.0. Um, and we didn't like the black boxy nature of it. And we had some issues with like not understanding what it was doing under the hood. And that really drove us towards like, we need to understand the YAML so that we understand exactly what Kubernetes is gonna do. And then we can put a layer of abstraction on top of it. Yeah, exactly. And and I think it's not until the, the, um, the abstractions and those layers reach a certain level of maturity where 
you can actually s avoid knowing what's going on under the covers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll, I'll share with, with you all a, a bit of an analogy. Um, I taught while I was in graduate school as well. And I would hear from the, from the students once in a while, well, it must be a bug in the compiler. <laughs> and after being in industry for 10, 20, now 30 years, I, my advice to developer, you know, with to young college grads is it's in my 30 year history, I have found one bug in the compiler. Now that changes a little bit when you start using frameworks because compilers, of course, have to have to achieve a level of, you know, completeness and correctness to be a compiler, but frameworks aren't, don't go through that same level of, you know, mathematical rigor. And so that's really what we're talking about is some frameworks that sit between Kubernetes as the runtime and the developer. And so right now those frameworks, those compilers, all of those things aren't mature enough that you, what your use case is saying is that they're not mature enough. We still need to know a little bit more about what's going on under the cover so that we can figure out what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And because you're building on top of all the like controllers or things running in the Kubernetes cluster, you really have to know. Yeah. Yeah, which that's a whole nother programming model. I'm super <laughs> interested in this, like bunch of reconcilers all pointing to the same resources and chaining together. Mm, there's a programming yeah. model there. It's super <laughs> interesting, but that's not today. Um, okay, so these these are kind of, you know, probably fairly familiar, although I'm sure people are learning a lot from kind of the, the details that we're going into here. Um, but I know from chatting with you over the course of the last couple of weeks that you have taken GitOps way beyond this. I mean, I would say that you're GitOpsing all the things or certainly a lot of the things. And so can you tell us about another thing that you're GitOpsing that might not just be applications running on Kubernetes? Sure. Um, so I think one of the newest ones that I'd like to go over is what I've kind of heard termed as sheet ops, um, but we've written a service, a Go service, that uh, is looking at our Amazon resources across all our different Amazon accounts. We have a plethora of them, and we have lots of resources in these accounts. And we have a need to tag them properly so that we can get proper cost attribution um, from team to team or business unit to business unit. And doing that in the Amazon console is not easy. They have a tool for it, but it would be so much better if we could just hand a Google Sheet over to a bunch of managers or even just engineers and you know, assign tags to these resources as these big lists. So we have this entire Google Sheet that has different worksheets for each resource, S3, RDS, EC2, NAT gateway, whatever. And it lists all the resources out and it, you know, assigns what uh, region or account they're from. And then it has our tags for cost attribution. And they mostly are empty because there's a new effort, but someone can just go in and apply, you know, this is for the MFP product, or this is for the run product or something like that. And this reconciler running in the Kubernetes cluster will talk to the Google sheet and apply those tags back to the resources in Amazon. And we've made a very a good distinction between uh, Amazon is the source of truth for what resources exist, but the Google Sheet is the source of truth for what the tag should be. So there's this reconciliation process that gets the resources from uh, Amazon, gets the list of stuff in the Google Sheet, and either removes or adds or applies the tags. Um, and so to me, this feels like GitOps because even though we're not using Git, we're using this kind of source of truth and we're using a reconciler to apply um, changes automatically, and it feels like GitOps to me. Interesting. So it's GitOps without Git. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> and we've been talking about that the last couple of days, that GitOps, you know, for some people, it's like, it's, it's Git, it's in the name. But mm -hmm. I've been spending a fair bit of time emphasizing the fact that it's actually, there's, you know, other sources, and we're all doing that because we all have images. Now, mm -hmm. in, in the case of images, it's actually Kubernetes that follows the references, but the application configuration that's in Git has references to the, to the image, you know, to the images that are stored in the repository. Um, so I don't know, Kyle, whether you saw <clears throat> my first talk this morning where I talked about the, the versioning, the Git mm -hmm. versioning. Did you see that? I did, I did, yeah. So are you versioning? these Google Sheets? We aren't because we don't see a need for it, but Google 
sheets can be versioned, right? So it totally could fit, um, but we've chosen that we don't need that version history um, because it's just a tag for cost attribution. If we really needed to, we could turn it on. Ah, very good point. Those are both really good points is here is, um, you know, I spent some time talking about how you can add the version history yourself to a repository that doesn't support it. But here's one that does. You're right. Google, mm -hmm. Google Docs, Google Sheets, they all keep the version history. And I believe there's configuration values on how often they, they store the version history and how often they capture it. But then you bring up a really good point, which is once you've assigned these cost attribution labels, you probably don't need to go back and say, well, actually, let me go back to the way that I was charging people <laughs> last week. Um, you've assigned that label and it's not, it's not gonna create a production outage. I mean, it, the worst that can happen is that one of your departments says, I'm not responsible for this. And you say, <laughs> oh, okay, we'll, we'll back that back out. We'll yeah. assign a different tag. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, and uh, let's see, are there, were there any other kind of, that seems like it could have been pretty straightforward. Were there any surprises in creating that implementation, either good or bad? Um, well, one of the surprises was we actually had to uh, go apply a tag for our Datadog integration to a bunch of different resources in Amazon. And so we just kind of hacked the tool a little bit to control that tag. And then we could just in the sheet quickly you know, drag down true for all, for all that tag that we wanted to apply to all the resources. And then it just went and applied it. And now we have Datadog monitoring on all of our stuff. So it became, we realized it could actually become this really cool process where as things get around metadata and these tagging concepts, we could use this tool to leverage easy management of that kind of stuff without having to go into all these different AWS accounts and do the work manually. Okay, interesting. Um... So I hear that we have a question in the Slack. So Tamo, can you uh, maybe pass on that question for us? Are you ready? Yes. Yep. Sorry, giving Stacy my three second heads up so she can <laughs> frame my face. Um, well, it was a bit of a comment. Well, one was uh, someone looked it up and said, I thought this was a joke, but sheet offs is for real. <laughs> so they're sharing, <laughs> they're sharing the link in the Slack, which is great. Um, and uh, you know, people, uh, Wondering, one person was sharing, so I, I gave credit to Carlos, who I think shared that link too when we had the earlier conversation. Um, so a, kind of a comment, but in a way it could point to a question was that, um, you know, one kind of use case, which was going around a month or so ago, was using um, API calls uh, from the browser to call Kubernetes, and it could only handle scaling in, in and out rather than um, what he, he was quoting you, uh, your reconciler pulls the sheet via API which mm -hmm. apparently can do quite a lot more. Um, so yeah, I was just curious uh, if that kind of comes into play as something you thought about or you just kind of like, we got sheets, so let's just <laughs> try this and, and see where it goes. Yeah, so we only run, it only runs once a day. It's not something that we care to change that often or that people are making changes that often. So we took that into consideration. I think it takes like, we have like 15 or 16 Amazon accounts. So it takes like 15 and 20 minutes to even just pull all the data from Amazon. Um, and there could be problems with like API throttling there too that we might get into. But because it's just tags and it's cost attribution, which is like over the course of months, we've, we found that if we just run it once a day or maybe once a week, like that will eliminate that as a class of problems. Yeah. And within the framework of what we've talked about for these two days of, um, you know, Cornelius sort of framing these, these four uh, check boxes, but uh, you know, start where you can. Is this or has it been a way to at least help people visualize a different way of thinking? And it could potentially be something that people could kind of play with so that somehow Google Sheets familiar, <laughs> what's scary about that? But there's a, there's, a, there's a concept that's at play that then you can show and then say, okay, now we're going to try something bigger. Yeah, and that's why we took on this cost attribution thing first for this, because it's low impact, but it's really impactful for our business, right? Like in terms of like attributing costs to different teams. So it, was, so it was low impact to like the criticality of like selling church and shoes, but it's high impact to the business. So 
it's it, if it gets wrong, if some a few things are mislabeled or mistagged, it's not that bad. And that's why we chose that that op like to take this uh, as a thing first. Yeah. And um, mentioned with humor, but it could actually be honest. So Steve, one of our speakers, has said, "Is Kyle going to open source that? I need this in my life." <laughs> Do you, actually, I, I haven't asked this before, but yeah, what is your kind of open source culture and under, under Armour? Do you have you guys had projects that you put out there? And um... I think we have. Uh, I, this team hasn't personally. Um, I would love to if I could if I could convince leaders. Um, I mean, we wrote we learned Go also in the process of making this, so um, we wanted to make it in Go so that it could eventually be open source because. I think tag management is super painful in Amazon, and this would be great if people could just hook up whatever Google Sheet and manage all the resources that way. Um, I think it's stu still too early to say, um, but my my direct manager is excited to to the possibility of open sourcing it. Yeah, and you've also shared how um, uh, this seems like a strange use case, but every time I share it, people get really excited. Have you <laughs> have have any of your um, colleagues or people in the community actually gone and tried their own version after talking to you, or are you still the single uh, kind of big use case of these sheet ops? Uh, so we program? wrote it to give to our cost. We have a person in our organization who's responsible for managing cost, and he's excited about it, and we're and he's going to be rolling it out to teams. Um, yeah we've only had the one use case of like having to add some other tag to stuff and we were just amazed at how easy it was mm -hmm. so i am excited to, to hear what people in our org are going to think of managing their cost tags this way yeah and as, as we were talking i was joking that uh you know kelsey hightower is after this and so if any of his colleagues over on the you know enterprise google sheet side you know chimes in you know tunes in they'll be like oh wait a minute <laughs> yeah yeah yep. so, um what I think, thank you, Tama. Um, what I think is really interesting about that is you just touched upon it a little bit, Kyle, when you talked about who you built this for, is that what we're talking about is a different user interface. Now, you and I, the propeller heads in the room, we're like, oh, Git, it's all about Git. And Git, everybody's used, to, everybody knows Git. Um, but the reality is, is that Git is, is pretty darn scary, especially for somebody who probably spends more of their time in a, a spreadsheet. So when you talk about somebody who's controlling cost attribution, are they, they're not a programmer then? Nope, they are not. Yep. <laughs> I mean, he's more technical, but we're also gonna hand this out to managers who, or product managers who maybe not have ever used Git or don't even have a GitHub account. So they can now do operations easily. Yeah, and what I think is interesting is that I can imagine, and I'd love your comments on this, I can imagine extending that where, okay, the user interface is sheet ops. And I think I've seen some patterns where people describe it this way, is the, the user interface is sheet ops, but you could also imagine that instead of your reconciler actually applying that to Amazon directly, that it applies it into a uh, a, a Git repository, that there's some format. If you did want to roll back, this is again, where you could take that and say, okay, this is just the user interface, but the source of record now is in fact Git because I'm not doing cost attribution, but I'm doing something else where I do want to, to maintain some history of this and be able to do rollbacks. So envisioning any use cases where you, you tweak it just slightly? Um, I don't know for us, but I did see that there is like a kubectl scaling sheet ops thing, um, which is really interesting. We can just put the numbers of like what what deployments you want to be at what replica count, yep. and it will go and reconcile that for you. So I think it's a burgeoning change uh, for doing operations that way that maybe someone who's less technical and doesn't know Git can can work with. Yeah, really cool. Okay, so sheet ops, awesome. <laughs> what else? What do you? What else are you get opsing? Yeah. Um, so when I first came on and was a, a release engineer, uh, one of the big trouble, one of the big pain points that we had was um, a single dev environment that had had a team of like twelve to fifteen developers on it, and a lot of different features happening in, in progress, and they wanted a way. Uh, what, what they were doing was talking to each other in Slack and trying to like organize merging their changes into this common branch and getting it deployed out to an environment. So 
I saw an awesome opportunity for um, automation, I thought at the time, um, to, you know, reduce that friction. Um, so what I ended up is I set out to build a process that would given a base branch, say master, and a regex for uh, feature branches, say feature slash or something like that, and a target branch, we'll say dev or soak or something like that. Uh, reconcile the when a change happens to one of those feature branches, automatically do the merges into that uh, branch from the base of master, and then take that result and push it to that development branch or soap branch. And then that would kick off another automation process that would deploy that out to the environment. So it's as simple as a developer just having to work in Git and commit their changes to Git. And then it would automatically, through automation, get uh, reconciled to like which branches should be merged in which order. So it would, it would prefer branches that had been previously merged but unchanged. It would merge those in first. And if there was any merge conflicts, it would bounce it out and spit out a Slack message somewhere. Um, but uh, this, it would build up this end result, push it to the branch. So now you have record of that end result. And then you have another process, pick that up and deploy that out to the environment. So they never had to actually interact with each other anymore, technically. They just had to make changes to their feature branch and got notified if it didn't work or didn't merge properly and monitor the de development environment. And we could put, you know, four or five features out on a soak environment where we could let them test with like 5% of traffic or something like that. Interesting. Now, you said, when you first started describing that, you said, oh, I thought that I could add some automation. So, so you, you, you kind of said, well, in, initially it was just automation. What took it from just being automation to being GitOps? I think the fact that it, it reconciles what should be there and was using Git as the like source of truth to like what happened over time. So you could see like, oh, my feature branch bounced out here because it would add in the commit message, like each one that was either added or deleted or taken out, that kind of stuff. So I think that reconciliation part is really important and, and probably one of the more important parts of this GitOps because um, what was happening is someone would commit to say feature branch A, that commit would cause this process to trigger, right? Um, and that's the automation piece, but the, the reconciliation piece is the smart piece to make sure that what's going to that branch is the correct stuff that should be going to it. Okay, interesting. Um, now, you talked earlier about your sheet ops and you, you mentioned that it's a, a Go program. Um, what out of curiosity, what did you implement this automation in? The, the oh, this specific yeah, uh, this, this use case. Well, you know, in what Groovy, is the reconciler? It's yeah, in Groovy, in Groovy, in Groovy, um, and some Bash a little bit. Uh, okay, fair <laughs> so enough. So it's just a combo of stuff. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, and we're so you said it gets triggered. We got low level stuff. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Bash. And you said it gets triggered when somebody does a check-in or something like that. Yeah, uses gets uh, machinery to notify when to run this. Um, and also, since it's built into, we use Jenkins and Jenkins pipelines, it would run tests on that branch first and okay. make sure that it's passing all that stuff. And then if it passed all that stuff, it would run this reset process is what we called it. Um, and then that would push to the resulting development branch or soak or whatever, and that would get tests run. So your, your stuff would get run through a lot of tests to make sure that it was good before it actually got deployed out to the shared environment. Interesting. And I, I actually don't think you chuckled a little bit when you said Groovy, but what you're effectively doing in that Groovy code is you're coding up a workflow, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and so Groovy doesn't sound like a, a crazy choice for coding <laughs> up workflows. Um, yeah. So In the language of Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there you go. Exactly. Um, so, so did this provide immediate benefits to your developers? Did they see it right away and like, oh, you saved me, you know, so much time, or I no longer have to worry about, you know, these these complex, you know knowing the workflow in my head, you've actually now co codified the workflow mm -hmm. that everybody had kind of in their head, maybe had some differences and things like that. Did, how did the developers react to this? No one ever came and thanked me. <laughs> 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 um, but they definitely stopped that, that there was a channel that there was so much chatter in of like organizing this and that all went away. So I assume mm -hmm. that that made it so much better. 
Um, yeah. We were actually using Garrett at the time. So we actually had, I don't know if anyone's ever used Garrett, but you can like add flags to your code review. And we had these plus one flags that you could add for like the SOAK or development branch. And so that's all they really had to do was go in there and click that and, and that would kick it off at the time. We've evolved it to be Git commit based later on as we got off Garrett. Um, but it's this process that you, once you have it, you kind of take it for granted almost, right? Because it's, it's just there and it will do the right thing for you. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, I think, so ah, I know th there's maybe one last example that I'd like to, to touch upon. Um, and that is, uh, and then I'm gonna do a time check for a moment. Um, <laughs> Damani, I see you jumping in. Did we not have until 1.50 or? Uh no, no, no. I think we had a, a, a brief change. So maybe you can finish up this last comment and then we're going to do, we're going to do a little bit of some music before the next. Uh, okay. Super, super. Sorry for not being in sync on the schedule. I need some kind of a reconciler there for me. So, <laughs> um, but I do want to ask you if it's okay, Kyle, about one last thing you mentioned um, that you're using cops and that you're using cops to manage your Kubernetes environments. And we've heard a fair bit about people. And I talked earlier and others have talked about things like cluster or API and actually using the GitOps principles to manage your Kubernetes clusters themselves. So any plans on that? Yeah, we're, I definitely want to push us towards cluster API in the future. Uh, some, we can set up a single management cluster that maybe infrastructure is responsible for, maybe using like GKE or uh, Amazon's Kubernetes solution. And that'll be the like management cluster. And we can apply manifest to that where this cluster API reconciler is to manage our other clusters. And what this would unlock for us is the ability for developers to self-service cluster creation or cluster config change. Um, and it gives us that Git history record where we can see what's happening, what's changing to our clusters. And we can even hook Flux into that so that they don't have to manually apply it to the cluster. We can now just automate away cluster creation, modification, or even deletion. Outstanding, outstanding. All right, so um, thank you so much for all of those. It's been so fun to geek out with, with you on this. Um, really, really fun to get down in the weeds on some of those things. Uh, any other things other than cluster API, where do you wanna go next? Uh, flagger, uh, after seeing Stefan go over that, I'm like, that's a high priority now. We've had a lot of use cases where people have been like manually applying uh, canary deployment resources or using our Nginx ingress annotations to shift traffic between stuff. And that's a lot of manual process and Flagger just knocks out the automation of that so yeah. easily. It's really nice. Yep. If you will, you were describing earlier that, you know, kind of a canary deployment of your environments um, <laughs> yeah. when you were talking about the HA use case. And I put down in my notes, hmm, Flagger. Um, and true, Flagger is usually, it is mostly used for application deployments, but the concepts of blue grain deploys and canaries and things like that apply to, to clusters and infrastructure as well. So yeah, I was talking in the GitOps uh, Slack about how I really want Flagger, but for cluster traffic management, yep. um, it would be really awesome. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, again, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I assume that people can continue to reach out to you on the Slack channel in the WeWork Definitely. Slack, the GitOps, and I'm sure that they can find you there as an individual as well. So. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for being such a great part of our community and helping so many people get started on their journey. Yeah, thank you.